You're listening to the City of London Sinfonia Views from the Pit podcast. In part one, we'll bring you stories from the orchestra pit by some of our musicians, and insight into Opera Holland Park's 2017 season and the Grenfell Tower Memorial Performance with James Clutton, the director of opera at Opera Holland Park, in conversation with Matthew Swan. So we're here at Opera Holland Park, and I'm here with Catherine Spencer, our first clarinet player. And a plant. And a plant. <laughs> Catherine, um, how does your role change from being on stage in full view, like you normally are, to being in an orchestra pit? Are there any different challenges? Well, really, we're still on view, and we can't be too naughty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, well, I mean, it's no different at all. I'm, I'm not probably not meant to say that at all, am I? It's meant to be very different, but it's not. We're still totally on view. We're still part of the performance. We're still listening in the same way, very much like chamber music. Um, in fact, it's interesting because you listen backwards in a sort of chambery kind of way, mm-hmm. but you listen forwards in a way that you're obviously listening to your fellow orchestral players but you're taking the lead from the conductor in the way you would in an orchestral concert so there's almost that sort of dual link so it's weird great okay (laughs) um how's the season going so far are you enjoying it it's Um, cool great i like meeting up beforehand eating too much i've just had a chocolate brownie (laughs) i like all the cakes we get i don't actually make any but no one seems to notice that's quite (laughs) good i just eat them um, Great. What else is good? I don't know. And um, can you tell us anything about Rondinei or Don Giovanni? Have you got any favourite moments? Um, well, I like my favourite moment in Rondinei is the conductor. He's nice. Okay. That's always That's good. That's Matthew Aldrin. Yeah, he's cool. I like him. And uh, and my favourite moment in Don G actually is going to be tonight. Oh. <laughs> It's going What's to be tonight. tonight? Isn't, it, isn't it the young artist it tonight? Is, yeah. It is, yeah. And I'm totally, totally in love with the voice of the Commendatore. I just think he's the most amazing thing that's ever, ever happened. It's a great moment in the opera. It's brilliant. Yeah. He makes it. And um, how do you find going between the two operas? Because obviously you're doing Don Giovanni one night and Rondonet the next night. How do you find switching between the two so often? Well, you're doing Don Giovanni, Rondonet, hospitals, other concerts, examining, yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah. Chamber music concerts, festivals. So, I mean, that's just life and one has to be adaptable as a professional musician. I like it. That's why I am the professional musician I am, because of that kind of switch. Yeah, keeps things interesting. Um, Have you got any good anecdotes or anything funny happens during the rehearsal period or during any of the shows? Well, you'd probably say there's lots to tell there because we're always giggling through quite a lot of the shows and the performances. I'm just wondering whether I can share any of that. Maybe I'll share that in the interval. I shall (laughs) mull over that now. Okay, we look forward (laughs) to hearing it. Okay, so it's the interval of Don Giovanni and we're back here with Catherine Spencer, aka Waffy, and she's got a funny anecdote for oh, us. Oh, no, I haven't got a funny anecdote. Okay. Now, now there's pr- too much pressure, too much <laughs> pressure. I haven't got a funny anecdote. But I was thinking about your first question, which was, what's it like to be in the pit um, as opposed to visibly on the stage? And I was saying how we, we are visible, actually, in this pit. And then it got me thinking, actually, we're very visible, but so are the audience. <laughs> and you see, the thing is, is the clarinets 
don't really do a lot. I mean, of course, when we play, it's very important and very wonderful, but a lot of the time we get to sit very silently and watch our lovely audience in front of us. So we can do quite a lot of people watching. And so I've rather enjoyed that. And in fact, the other night, there was a little laddie on somebody's lat, lap, and, and he was only very small, probably four, and he sat all the way through Don Giovanni, really, really quietly, just sitting on the end of his mum's lap. Okay. And then the commendatore came in, and you could almost see his eyes just popping out. And he sat there, and he sat there, and eventually he couldn't take it anymore, and he just went back into his mum's arms, and it was really <laughs> wonderful. And then you get, there was the other day, there was this couple on the very back row, just like they were at the back row of the cinema, and they were canoodling, and they were so in love, and it was so wonderful too, and I liked that as well. I'm guessing that was in Rondon, eh? No, no, that was Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni, Don Giovanni okay. yeah. They were very in love and it was wonderful. I liked that. I, I think people should be encouraged to um, be in love at the opera. Okay. And, um, and then, oh, and, <laughs> and then there was a lady who looked just like my cat. And that isn't a bad thing because my cat is the most beautiful animal on the planet. So I enjoyed that, the lady who looked like my cat. Um, and um, we do quite a lot of people watching. I mean, of course you do. You do concentrate on the music as well too. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But I'm, I'm a yeah. multitasker, yeah. Okay. of course. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing I wanted to say was that sometimes when, when, when we've got the, the very long bit in the first act to sit and look at the audience, um, we're very lucky because in some opera pits you can only see the front row. And what we do like to do, us musicians, is count how many people are asleep on the front row. Then we add up what that might cost in money and then we times that by how many people we think there must be in the whole audience asleep and then we see how much money it costs to be asleep at the opera. But here, you can see the whole audience, so you can do a much better count. It's really good. Great. I shan't tell you how much it costs to be asleep for a whole audience at Opera Holland Park, but obviously not very many. Very attentive audience. <laughs> So we're here with Matt Maguire, who's leading the viola section for Don Giovanni and Rondonet. Hello. Hello. Are you enjoying yourself so far? Very much so, yeah. Good. How does your role change from when you're on stage in full view, like normal, to when you're in a pit, like we are at the moment? Um, are there any sort of different challenges? Well, actually, I think, because we are on quite, you know, we're on show, it's very similar to being on stage in many ways. Yeah. So it's unique, actually. Have you enjoyed the season so far? Yeah, no, it's been great. Yeah. yeah. Um, any favourite bits of either of the operas? Well, actually, I think my favourite bits have changed just as it's okay. gone on, and especially in the Mozart, I thought I had my favourite aria, and then I think as it goes on, well, me definitely, my ears opened up, and sort mm. of really get to listen to the singers more, and then get into the music that way. And I mean, it's the whole whole of Don Juan. I think it's amazing. Rondine, um I love the last duet. It's amazing. And how, how do you find switching between the two operas? Do you have to kind of get your head in a different mindset? Um, I suppose so, but I don't really think that much about it. I think, especially now, as we're sort of like the final performances, it's very much, you know, where you stand, you just get into the zone when you get here. I think at first, yeah, maybe it was a bit different, mm. trying to sort of get my head around it and um, not remembering how it went, but sort of... Yep preparing yourself for the length of it but now they just fly by so yeah in a good way though have you got any funny stories has anything amusing happened over this this period of playing or rehearsing um i'd say the funniest thing that had happened really is um that night uh, don giovanni night when it was freezing oh um, with the rain coming in with the rain coming in and the wind blowing everything everywhere and actually i thought you know what, I don't need any extra layers, I'm fine. Because I did that opera last year and um, I was fine just in my shirt and my trousers. Everyone was talking about bringing the thermals well, the and the scarves. trombones and... have a suitcase of blankets, don't they? Yeah, so, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, and you know, probably being a northerner, I thought, oh, I'll be all right. But um, actually, I was freezing. 
<laughs> and then it wasn't very nice at all. Yeah, the, the pit's a bit of a wind tunnel, isn't it? It is, really. The entrances are the same. And, you know, so. I was get, at the end of it, I was getting goosebumps because of the music, but I was definitely getting goosebumps because of the weather as well. <laughs> and it was quite funny, actually. I did sort of, like, laugh a couple of times where the wind was just sort of, like, blowing music of stands and you just heard Crash Bang Wallop yeah. backstage and uh, adds to the drama of the opera, I suppose, It certainly it? does. sat with James Clutton, who is director of Opera at Opera Holland Park, the newly independent Opera Holland Park. We just thought we'd hear from James about what it is that makes the relationship between CLS and Opera Holland Park so special and, and what's different about the way the orchestra is presented here. So thank you for talking to us, James. You're very welcome. It's lovely to have you here. Um, now, I've noticed you do, you do something that I've never seen in any other opera company before, which is before the start of each opera and dress rehearsal and all mm-hmm. the rest of it, you take a little walk in front of the pit and you just <laughs> say hello to a few people and shake the hands of the leader. I do. I do. I think some of it, some of my team will tell you some of that's just my OCD, that it's, uh, it's just about that I've done it for so long. It, it's become a bit of a ritual now, a bit of a superstition, but, uh, but it started and it still is really just about connecting with people before they do it. I see all of my uh, cast uh, before they go on stage individually. And because the orchestra are in a position where I can get to them here, it's just a nice thing to do to sort of, you know, connect eyes and say, have a good show, you know, and know that, you know, there's a there's someone in the management of the company, you know, wishing you well before you start. Mm. I think one of the big strengths here, actually, generally, is that because it's not a pit, which brings us other, other, other challenges, obviously. Mm. Um, well, you couldn't do what you do, shaking hands in a normal you, orchestra. You just practice. couldn't do it. Yeah. So that would break that down. You also don't get the, the, the feeling that they're absolutely all part of the show, the orchestra at Holland Park. I think that people watch different plays. They get used to seeing some players in position, someone like mm. Mark, who's there every show, whatever. People on auditorium left get used to seeing him there. There becomes a rapport between audience, uh, pit and stage that... Um, you know, normally one would want a, a, a stage with an orchestra pit and everything, but some of the reasons that we, you know, we'd probably change if we had an absolute you know, endless budget. Mm. Are some of the things that make it extra special, I think, that you get that complete connection between, the, you know, the three p- parts: the stage, pit, and the audience, and they all they're all in the same thing together. I think, it, and also the players, I think, see more of the operas here. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they understand what they're playing, why the conductor's saying, can we do this in a different way? They can see more of it, and it just becomes more of a creative whole, I think. Yeah, because I, your colleague Mike Volpe has often talked about the sort of informal nature of Opera Island Park, and what's the phrase you use? Is London's most informal, glamorous night out or something, something like, like that? Yeah, sounds yeah. sort of like him, doesn't it? It does, it yeah. does sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's right, but I think that, <clears throat> you know, some people have said to me in, in interviews in the last year about our dress code and I, it's a regular you know reply of mine that unless you're in the show it doesn't really matter about the dress code it's not that it can't be a special night out for you I'd like it to be a special night out for you if you want to dress up dress up it's the thing that you don't have to Yeah. and I think that that's the informality it's not that we're saying you have to be you know not in a suit or not in a tie it's not that at all it's just about you you come as how you relax and how you want to see yeah. how you want to see us us do the work. I, I think the players get that as well because I mean they're, they're in their, their orchestral blacks and they're, yeah. they're there to do a job and do it very professionally and yeah. it's, it's always nice to sort of see at the end of every review we get that yeah. you guys get and it's oh CLS played quite well as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but they do kind of get the informal nature of of what you're trying to do and I I, I mean it's it's difficult to define how that comes across unless you've seen it but there is an element of. As you say, the players are very much part of the performance, but they 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 kind of join in with the whole vibe and ethos of, of the thing as I well. I think they do. I think that for me, when there's a curtain call at Holland Park, orchestra always get, if not the biggest one, certainly one of the biggest ones, because people have seen them work all through the night. They've they've seen them actually playing, and I think that I understand the the culture of if you're in an orchestral pit and you've finished five minutes before the end of the piece and you can disappear home. I understand that, of course, yeah. but there is something very you know a collective. Uh, applause for that collective effort at the end of a thing when you've got all the singers singing stand on stage, the orchestra mm. stand in the pit, 
it's just that okay everyone has really worked hard here yeah you know and I think that yeah it's not like going down into a mine or something that sort of work but we, everyone puts a lot of skill a lot of time a lot of effort mm-hmm. into it and at the end of it just to stand there and say to everyone yeah thanks yeah. You know, I doubt whether well, it's certainly working hard this season I'm thinking some of the speeds that Dave Lamb took Don Giovanni well yeah but I mean you know it's one of the many reasons I gave Dan that job to bring that under three hours <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, James, uh, James is referring to this, there's various sort of rules and regulations about working in orchestra and there's, there's kind of a three hour set call and we were, we were all doing everything we could <laughs> You know, sort of being slightly mean to the audience. Come on, get back in, get back get in. Back Let's in. get it under three hours. No, but I think it works anyway. But yeah, I mean, it's hard work being in orchestras, you and all you guys know. And I think that going back to your first uh, question, that's why I like everyone to feel that I, I understand that, you know, they're part of the team. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just thinking of some of the sort of orchestral highlights here for me, things like um, Turn of the Screw and especially Jonathan Dove Flight, where the orchestra really played such a big part in yeah, the sort of storytelling of it. Absolutely. And all that percussion there. And yeah, I think, well, you mentioned two of my, two of my favourites, and yet uh, over, the, over the last 17 years or so, but I think that um, unusually really, because they're not sort of pieces that you know, one would normally associate with us, um, both pretty modern, it, well, one very modern, yeah. one, uh, you know, 20th century piece. But I think that's why they stand out in some ways, because they're very different to what yeah. we do. That orchestration for Turn the Screw, I think it's 12 or 13 players. So you're about that, yeah. Yeah, it sounded so big and so full. Yeah. And Flight was big, uh, but that was, uh, you know, that was a terrific thing. But I think over the years, you know, the CLS have, have just become an opera orchestra, haven't they? Yeah. You know, they've played a lot of work over that time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, when you get into that, and especially with the Verismo stuff that we do, uh, that Mike loves... Well, we all love, but it might find it. You know, they, mm. you can see how much they enjoy in playing something that's really full-blooded. And well, I, you know. I, I think with that, because I mean, the, the pit is not huge. It's not, you know, Bayreuth Festspiel House, where yep. the, the opera house that Wagner built for his vast orchestras. It's, yep. it's relatively compact, yep. bijou in expectation <laughs> terms. Um, Equidistant from yeah. the audience <laughs> and, and, and the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but you know we're doing sometimes doing some quite big repertoire, especially that Verissimo stuff, that late nineteenth century, early twentieth yep. century Italian stuff, and it does require, especially the string players, to make a big sound. Yep. And I think there's an advantage of having an orchestra like CLS, who are used to playing with relatively small forces, and string players who, you know, it, even with sort of ten or eight first violins as opposed mm. to sixteen or whatever yeah, in some yeah. of the big opera houses can make that massive, warm, full-blooded sound. Absolutely, I completely agree. And I think also, once again, going back to the what, we th- what one would normally think of as being disadvantages becoming advantages, because there's because it's not in a sunken pit and covered, there's, a, there's an immediacy to the sound. Yeah. It's one of the great things you can say, the sound really comprises of asking the orchestra to be softer or asking the singers to sing up. You know, that's it. That's it. It's not this massive technical... No. Uh, Thing, but I think there's a liveness to the sound here with uh, with the orchestra that just is is really immediate, and I think that when it really works, it goes straight to a you know a heart rather than a head thing. Yeah. It's a very visceral thing here. Well, it's know. also that immediacy as well. I mean, as you say, turning disadvantage, supposed disadvantages into advantages. If a conductor, because the conductor's getting what what the the audience hears, which yep. is not the, quite the case in most pits, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You I'm know, sort if, of if like there's that. something wrong, he he or she can fix the the balance immediately and just yep. make it. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Wrong. I haven't thought of it like that. Yeah. You know, on that line, one of the other ones I always say about uh, disadvantages that become advantages because of the nature of um, it's got better and better over the last couple of years. But our backstage here is not that big. It's all on one floor. It's yeah. every, so everyone tends to see everyone. Yeah. every night mm. so you get all members of the chorus knowing the orchestra the principals all knowing everyone in the in the crew it just becomes a much more of a team effort because yeah. of those things that you you know you can't you can't escape people even well, if you wanted to you it's, it's that word that you use and we use as well as a lot it, it's family isn't mm. it you know you're, you're kind of all in this together there's no I mean again some of the big opera houses the orchestra never meet any of the, the chorus or Indeed. The stage Indeed. Or principals or whatever it's no. all very separate yeah absolutely and I think so I think that's a, that's where it comes from some of it and I think when audiences audiences wouldn't be able to absolutely pick out that those are the reasons why they feel like this but yeah. they instinctively know it when they see it that there's a, a common yeah. goal and uh, achievement
I, I think the, the, the thing that has kind of pleased me most, although sadly it's one that's come out of great tragedy, is when you came to me two or three weeks ago and you said, look, we're, we're putting on this event for the, the victims and the families of, of yeah. Grenfell Tower, um, and would the orchestra be, be prepared to do it? Um, and I said to you, well, I, I can't speak on the orchestra's behalf um, because, we're, you know, we're, everyone's giving their time for free. Yeah. Um, but let me ask them. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I, I sent an email to, to all the players uh, saying, you know, Opera Holland Park are wanting to, to do this. And very sadly, they've been touched personally by the, the tragedy. Um, and, you know, have so much of that. Your Inspire work is in that area yeah, as well. Absolutely. And, the response was overwhelming and immediate from every single one of the players, even a couple of our players that don't really do much opera on Park. They right. absolutely got how important the relationship oh, was between great. the organisations and came straight back and said, yeah, of course we'll do it. No, it was fantastic, Matthew. As you say, we'd given anything, we'd give anything that we didn't have to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, that night, because he said we were very personally affected by it here, and uh, and the, and all of this area of West London has been, uh, you know, affected by it. Um, but there was a feeling of of, of togetherness here around that time, mm. uh, and you know, I was thrilled when the, you said that it was even possible because you know, I, you know, I understand that because we never ask people to do things for free ourselves, and no. so um, and because it is a work and it's so easy to fall into that trap, but it it felt. It felt different, yeah. Uh, and because we were doing it so quickly, yeah, uh, it, it felt right. And so I think you know all of all of the orchestra have been amazing. We've got two conductors on it. We've got in the region of seventy in the chorus at the moment. Mm. There's a real feeling of yeah. Mike and I were talking about this. It's not much. We're not the emergency services, Matthew. No. You know what we do. Me and you is run organisations that provide art and take people out of the terrible times for a couple of hours yeah and and i'm not you know not going against it it's an incredibly important thing but that's what we do and if we can do that and, and raise some money i think it's looking like we'll probably raise about 30 grand that night wow as much as that uh, yeah because notice because you you put the thing on sale we're, we're talking now on the what the, the 7th of july and i think you put it on sale on the third or the fourth yeah i think it went in 36 hours yeah and and what we did on the uh on the website was just to have a donate button as well so even mm. if you couldn't go and so the money's come up because of that as well so people yeah. who can't go so they're still donating well again we got emails from some of the players who couldn't take part who said how do we donate you know if i can do something because the people are away or have got yeah it's an incredible reaction and i think you know going back to how close the, the two organizations ohp and C cls are I think that all comes down to it. I think that if yes they would have been affected by this tragedy because it's one of the biggest tragedies that London or the country's mm. had in, in many years um, but I think also because we're all here so much and you know we did a little tribute to our fallen friends uh, mm. at the end of the show one night and everyone sort of gets what it means to us and I think they're affected by it as well and there was yeah. a real feeling about the whole place and um I think that we'll, we'll do an amazing job that day. It would be yeah. a very moving day. Yeah, absolutely. It would be a very moving day and, yeah. and evening. But, um, but yes, it was uh, really forever grateful to, to your guys for pulling that together and you for pulling it together so quickly because it was very quick. It needed to be. And, yeah. and everyone stepped up and did it. Yeah. No, it's wonderful. James, thank you very much for talking to me today. And I will see you uh, next week for the Katia Cabanova dress rehearsal. Very good. Looking forward to it, Matthew. Very much looking forward to that. And my, my, my other half's coming to the first night of Katia. Excellent. I've been, I've been, she's been told to expect celebrities, so oh. <laughs> she's looking forward to that. Well, there shall be some celebrities here, that's for sure. But um, no, thanks for coming. Thanks for You've been listening to part one of the City of London Sinfonia Views from the Pit podcast, featuring CLS musicians Catherine Spencer and Matt McGuire in conversation with Alex Regan, James Clutton in conversation with Matthew Swan, and footage from La Rondine rehearsals at Opera Holland Park. This podcast has been produced and edited by Natasha Allery and presented by Zach Holstrom, Alex Regan, and Matthew Swan, part of the City of London Sinfonia executive team.